Hello once again everyone, another week, and another bonus video. So, as voted on by my guys, today we're going to be going over the basics of Sword and Buckler. Now, I'm not going to be going into specific plays with this, I'm just going to give a general overview so that way you can branch out and find what interests you. And the reason that is is because there are a lot of traditions of Sword and Buckler. Much like Staff, which we covered last week, a lot of cultures used it. Um, small shield compared with, you know, in conjunction with hand, Great combination, everybody loves it. So there's a lot of different traditions you can go off of, and pretty much all three of them that I study do include the buckler in some way. Um, and I don't even study near all of them that are out there. So, first, th th first things first. Let's talk about what traditions there are um, that are widely available, and what kind of equipment you should use with them in regards to swords and, and bucklers. So first, traditions-wise. In chronological order, the kind of oldest we have is 133. That's a German system from about the 13th century. Following that, we have Lignitzer, um, Andreas Lignitzer, and the other sort of early Lignitzer sword and buckler stuff. Um, follow, that's going to be about the late uh, 1300s, early 1400s. And moving on from there, we have the sort of mid to late 1400s. We have Tallhofer, who goes over Sword and Buckler, who is still part of the Society of Lichtenauer, at least according to himself. Following that, we get into the Bolognese tradition slash using the buckler in conjunction with a rapier. Um, this is from, of course, the uh, 1500s and from there on out, though it kind of stays in popularity all the way up through the 1600s, in which case we have... Um, people using the buckler in conjunction with shearing swords or back swords. Uh, well, broadswords at the time. So, pretty wide uh, bit of time to study. And generally, when it comes to what are you going to jump into, depends upon what interests you the most, um, time period-wise, because sword and buckler is a skill that, like I said, can pretty much appear wherever. So, for most people beginning... Probably the easiest ones to jump into are going to be the Bolognese tradition, because it's very widely studied. Um, there are a lot of Bolognese fighters out there, and they all pretty much work with the buckler at one point or another, so there's a lot of material out there, and there's a lot of historical material out there as well to work off of. Um, the big caveat of jumping into Bolognese is that some uh, masters put a lot of emphasis on the Assalto, which can be a little tricky, so in case you don't know what I'm talking about. The Assalto are kind of like Kata. Not quite, but kind of. And there are certainly useful things you will learn within it, and they are designed sometimes to mirror a fight. The issue is that, as, as a friend of mine once said, they kind of turn into the Zippo lighter tricks of the Renaissance. Um, some just get relatively needlessly complicated, and some masters who are writing them down maybe weren't necessarily all that skilled at writing things down, so it turns into these giant run-on sentences that you can drive yourself insane in reading. Useful to study? Absolutely. And if you want to prove you really understand a source, then after learning all the terminology, learn how to do an assalto and explain it to people. That's awesome. That's great. But if you are just like, I want to fence with sword and buckler, don't waste your time. <laughs> Not yet, anyway. Um, there's other material in the Bolognese tradition and, and things of that, and side sword in general, that covers how to fight with the buckler that is simple and easy. Some assalto more useful than others. Now, the other thing to consider when you're doing uh, bolognese is that sometimes uh, it has overlap with rapier and buckler of various traditions. So you can have Spanish, the um, I think even the English do it, um, but that will sometimes use what's called a targa, which is not quite a buckler. It is, but not quite, and has slightly different properties. We'll go over that in a moment. The other tradition that I would say is easiest to jump into with just no understanding, would be Lignitzer. The reason I say that is because Lignitzer, Andreas Lignitzer, has six lessons. Just six. I even have a video on the channel showing them all. Most of them are only about three or four parts long, and every single one of them is practical and will work. Now, the reason I say that is because they are all simple. I attack, he does this, I attack him again. You keep attacking but you're always, at the same time, pressuring him and getting him into a more and more cornered position. Um, I describe to my guys when I describe Lignitzer, I say, this is not a back and forth fight, this is a murder. Um, 
The other great thing about Ligmatzer is that any of those pieces in any of the plays, you can take and put in where you need it to, and it will work for you. Um, so Ligmatzer, in my opinion, is a really, really good one for people to jump in. It's easy to understand. The only downside of Ligmatzer is there are no pictures. So we don't know if he wanted us to be standing upright or if he wanted us to be in the hinged hip. We just don't know. I'll get back to that in a moment, though, when I get to posture. So the other one that I kind of hear a lot of people ask about is, you know, okay, what about doing things in regards to 133? So 133 is kind of the granddaddy of all sword and buckler treatises in one way or another. Not quite the same way that like Wikna or Fabris or Fiore are the granddaddies of their system, but more in regards to it's the earliest we have. The problem with 133, oh dear, it sounds like a takedown video, but the, the issue with 133 is that it's not necessarily the easiest thing to pick up and use. And in regards to the purpose of this video and the purpose of me talking about this stuff, I'm just wanting to go over things that are easy to pick up and use tomorrow. 133 is originally, um, in my opinion, supposed to be kind of a, a, a secular fighting. It is a one-on-one -on -one within a relatively small community. The priest, uh, who is the teacher of it, even mentions this is a move that only him and his students do. Um, so if you fight someone else, don't expect this. And it's not necessarily impossible to comprehend, but you're going to have a lot of trouble finding a good interpretation of it anywhere. There are some, and especially there are good interpretations for parts of it, but a whole thing all the way through, I have not yet seen one. Um, if there is one out there, that'd be great. I'd love to look through it. But it is a monster of a thing to try and work through. And you'll honestly use more time that you could be using learning a simpler system that will work for you tomorrow. So as an epidemic, academic, epidemic, as an, well, academic, epidemic thing, certainly worth a read, but I would say leave it off until you're a little more experienced with sword and buckler, then try to work from it. Now, I'm sure some 133 purists out there are going to co-crucify me tomorrow. Oh, well, I know, I know a faster system than that. But Joking aside, let's start talking about materials. So bucklers. This is your bog standard buckler. Uh, this is a medium sized buckler. Um, they come smaller than this, they come bigger than this. So the smaller ones usually are about, just literally, I've, I've one of my students even has one, it's so fun to fight with. Uh, it's just literally the boss with a handle on it. Um, and that gets quite exciting. I've also seen ones that are about yay big uh, from the boss, so it's almost the size of a targe, but it's a center grip. Um, you'll see ones that are all metal. You will see ones that are wood with an iron boss. Doesn't really matter. Um, depending upon what you are working on, it may recommend one buckler size or another. Um, for example, if you are doing silver, he seems to show a bigger buckler, um, which is, you know, it's a later tradition. If you are doing, um, you know, 133 or Ligmitzer, a smaller buckler tends to work a little bit better. If you're doing bolognese, I find a medium size is quite good. Now, the parts of the buckler are pretty straightforward. You have the boss, the rim, the face, and the handle. Really doesn't get much more complicated than that. The biggest thing when it comes to choosing what buckler works for you is understanding that the smaller the buckler, the easier it is to move because it's not going to get caught up on anything. And pretty much all sword and buckler requires a decent amount of crossing your hands. So it's not gonna get caught on anything. The problem is it protects you a lot less. A larger size buckler protects you a lot more, but now is much harder to move your arms around. So depending upon what tradition you're doing, it may lend itself to one or the other. Usually a medium size is what you wanna go for. I know default answer, who would have guessed? But I would recommend going for a, a medium-ish size, even if you wanna do a bigger buckler eventually, because learn to use it and then appreciate you don't have to move it as much when you have a bigger one. Um, and then if you want to pick up a smaller one, then it gets all sorts of fun. But there are different kinds of bucklers. So there are ones that are made of wood uh, with rawhide around the edge. Obviously, they still have the round shape, but they look a little bit different. We also have, for example, um, I have a Tollhofer buckler here, one of the two. So this one obviously has a very different shape to it. It's got these, you know, sort of I'm Batman sort of look, um, including these hooks that are coming off of the edge. There's another buckler depicted in Tallhofer where it's more teardrop shaped 
and curves much more dramatically forward and has spikes off of it. That's quite exciting. There are some bucklers that have little gates, basically. So it kind of looks like a like a horse track gate, just kind of raising up off the boss that things can get stuck in. Um, you will see other bucklers with small spikes on them or other protrusions. You also see what is called a targa, which I talked about before, which is basically a, um, a uh, what is the word? Trapezoid? I think it's trapezoid. Anyway, it's that shape together with a handle on the back and it's kind of wavy. So the ins the inner bit comes out and then it goes in and then this part comes out again on each side. So it kind of looks like a W. But those are kind of bucklers, kind of not. Um, I would say they fall within the family, but the biggest thing about targas and bucklers like this, as opposed to round bucklers, is that they have edges. Not sharp edges, and you can certainly make that happen, it's that literally, because they have this more, you know, slightly scalloped edge or, or sometimes a, you know, literal edge in regards to the squareness of the targa, they bind a little bit differently than a round one. Uh, even a round one with rawhide, where it does kind of stick in, things slide off a lot more. Versus this, it feels a lot more like actually binding with a sword, uh, which makes a lot more sense considering the postures that we see Talhofer or people using a targa taking, because they have basically a different weapon in their hand. So that is something to be aware of. Now, depending upon what tradition you're studying in regards to historical authenticity, you may want to go for one buckler over the other. So if I'm doing 133 where they have round bucklers, I should probably be using a buckler that looks like theirs. Um, if I am doing Thalhofer, I can do it with a round buckler, but I didn't really appreciate what he was showing until I picked up a buckler that looked like what he was using. Um, same thing with Targa. Though, I will give one warning. The other Talhofer buckler, the one that is, uh, stay, there we go. The one that is teardrop shaped with the spikes, it's pretty dangerous to use because it literally has spikes on it. And oftentimes we have movements where we're putting the buckler against somebody's arm and unintentionally you can stab somebody <laughs> and, you know, talk about the embarrassment of going to a sword class and getting stabbed with a shield. But, um, that one... You could make it safe, but usually it's a little bit dicey to use. So I'd avoid that one and go for that one instead if you want to do tall hopper stuff. But what about swords? So earlier period stuff, so Lignitzer, um, 133, all that. Arming sword works great. Um, only really disadvantage of the arming sword is that if you're trying to do later period stuff, obviously you should probably use later period sword. Um, these are pretty easy to find. Uh, quite a decent amount of people make arming sword trainers. This is the uh, Albion 133. You can see why I picked it up. Um, it's pretty great, but it's a little more expensive. So uh, the biggest thing to be aware of is that when you're doing positions where your sword and buckler need to be together, because it's basically flat and symmetrical, it's very easy for me to press my hands close together, so it lends itself quite nicely. And that means that a lot of people ask me, well, can't I use a messer for sword and buckler? Yes, you can. Um, messer works for pretty much all the early traditions the exact same way. Um, in fact, when I first started, I used a messer. Um, the only thing to be aware of when you're using a messer is that the noggle, that little guy right there, can get caught on your buckler. Um, literally getting caught, or also because the noggle is there, I have to angle it slightly differently to get that uh, that close together position, which is quite vital for some actions. So that is something to be aware of. However, it is also a little bit of extra protection on this hand. And by the time of Talhofer, pretty much everybody is using a messer in conjunction with a buckler as opposed to an arming sword. So that's to be aware of. Um, for later period stuff, of course, you use later period swords. So side sword for bolognese, you know, all that good stuff. And then you will even see a broadsword used. Um, for things like silver or even McBain covers, sword and buckler. But for most people who are jumping into it, you're going to either be jumping into, like I said, Bolognese or Lignitzer. For the former, you can get yourself a side sword and, um, you know, round buckler or targa, it doesn't matter. And for the latter, get yourself one of these. And then, uh, though a tall offer buckler also works, and then either a messer or an army sword. And you'll be good to go. So that's equipment. Now let's talk about some basic advice for sword and buckler that is 
pretty much universal. So first things first, let's talk about how your brain works. When it comes to using two weapons, the worst thing you can do is separate them. We don't want to get into the habit of, ah, 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 because that's no faster than me doing this, right? Instead, you want to think of them as doing the same job. As if I'd had both hands on a longsword, right? They're both doing the same job, slightly different jobs, but they're doing the same action. Sword and buckler is the same way. I want them working in conjunction, regardless of if they're actually together or if they're apart. So don't think of them as two things. Think of them as one thing. Now, what do I mean by together or apart? Well, you have two options really with the buckler. You can either have them together, in which case the buckler is kind of guarding your hand slash working along the blade. Or you can have them apart, which is where the buckler is extended and is covering an opening of mine, either, he, you know, usually just right here. And then my sword is defending the rest. Now, just because they're not together doesn't mean they're not working together. This is my forward defense. This is everything after and my offense. So they're always working together in one form or another. The other thing you need to know about buckler is how to turn the buckler and also how to preferably not die with the buckler. So let's go with turning the buckler first. So when it comes to gripping the buckler, you want to grip it the same way you would a sword, nice and relaxed. My pinky's probably the tightest. And then I like to put my thumb right on that corner. This is so that way I can turn the buckler's face pretty much at will without having to move my whole hand because in heavier gloves, that's just harder to do. And under the moment, it gets even more hard to do. Now, in regards to when you would turn the buckler and moving it, I like to compare it to faces of the moon. So I got full moon, about, you know, half moon, crescentish moon. So crescent moon is going to be used when I am engaging on stuff, you know, actively using it like I would an edge or keeping it close to my hand. Half moon is going to be usually when I am, you know, in the process of doing such a thing. So for example, here or something along those lines. And then full moon is when I'm just denying, you know, denying things out here or even actively pushing down onto someone's arm or something along those lines to attack from a different line. So those, that's when that comes up. The other movement you need to get used to is turning your arm over. The reason for this is that sometimes we will have actions where our arms are crossed. Now, with my arm underneath my other arm and I need to cut, I don't want to hit my buckler. If I try to cut around my buckler at the moment, I'm hitting the guy over there. So what I do is I'm going to turn my arm over, so I've inverted it, so that way the cut can travel through. That is a useful skill to know how to do. It's also useful for moving my buckler over to defend my hand or things along those lines. So get used to your wrists basically being together when you're actively using it. Now, let's talk about not dying with the buckler. So the buckler is great, but it is a, a secondary. It's a secondary to your already secondary, I should point out. The ways that you're going to get killed are someone's going to get between your sword and your buckler, and you're not going to be able to use either effectively. Sword is your best option if that happens, by the way. But, sword and movement. Option two is someone is going to get around your buckler to this side. So, probably the biggest thing that I could give advice-wise for sword and buckler is that sword and buckler in competition looks entirely different from anything in the manuals. I'll say that right now. Um, because sword and buckler pretty much in competition is going to boil down to, you know, faint high cover, hit somewhere low means your leg, means your ribs, etc. And the biggest fatal mistake that a lot of people make is that when an attack comes from here, right, so going into the ribs, they'll try to defend themselves with their buckler or just defending themselves with their buckler in general. Don't do this. The buckler is not that hard to get around. It's not as long as this. I can cover most of my entire side one way or the other with a sword. Buckler barely covers my own hand. So, if someone attacks low on this side, again, movement and moving my sword down. If I can't move my sword down, movement is my best friend. Now, obviously, there are going to be some times where someone's just got you. There may even be times where this does save you. 
But in general, you don't want to get into that habit. Because once you're in that habit, it's a lot harder to break. Defend yourself with the sword, attack with the sword, use the buckler to help. Right? So, that's the other bit, bit of advice I have for you, is use your buckler actively. And speaking of which, if you do not know what to do with the buckler in that moment, right? You're out of gas, you're out of ideas, you have no idea what to do with it. Stick it out in front of you and leave it there. The reason I say that is because out here, as we talked about, at the very least is denying you a route to my head. It is making it so you have to go around if you want to get my body. And if I stand right foot forward, there's even further that you have to go. Out here, even if it's tiring, it is defending you. Here, it's doing nothing for you, and you're going to have a lot more tendency to try and use it in a, in a not productive way. So, if you can't think of what to do with it, stick it out and leave it there. Okay, so, we've gone over those basics, we've gone over the traditions, now let's talk a little bit. Uh, we even went over crossing and uncrossing the arms. Now let's talk a little bit about posture, and this is kind of my last point for the day which is what kind of posture should you be using? Depends upon your tradition, but Sword and Buckler kind of has a somewhat special one that I want to go over. So most bolognese and, um, you know, silver and, and things like that are upright. You know, knees slightly bent, normal sort of posture. Same you'd do if you were using any other sword, really. However, 133 shows us the hinged hip. And Lignitzer has no pictures, but works really well with the hinged hip as well. And rapier also kind of has the hinge tip. So what is the hinge tip? Basically, I take my normal stance. I'm going to take my hips. I'm going to push them back as I sit back onto, um, usually it's going to be your, your left leg if you're right-handed, obviously the other way around if you're not. I keep my back straight and my front foot now becomes very light. I can withdraw it or lift it very easily because all my weight is kind of suspended directly below me. My back is straight, which keeps my arms nice and light. If it's hunched, this gets a lot heavier. My head is up, and my arms can now extend out. So what does this do for me? Well, the hinge tip basically makes it so that way your nearest target is my head or my lead hand. If you want to go for my legs or something along those lines, I have time to defend. I can void if I have to. It also keeps me farther away from danger. So I've limited what you can attack, which is also quite easily to defend because I know where you're going, and I've extended my ability to attack without exhausting myself or bringing myself closer to you. The hinge tip also does kind of appear in, um, so Tall Offer kind of shows it, his guys are fighting with a slight hinge in their bodies, not as dramatic as some people will do when recreating uh, 133. And in general, I think the hinge tip should be something that is fluid. Sometimes I'll go deeper, sometimes I'll be more upright, but either way, this slight hinge, this slight lean, where I am keeping my core back and my back straight is exceedingly useful for fighting out when I've got this defending me, um, be it here or here. Now, can you use it all the time? Yeah, it's not hard. Um, for example, rapier even has our rearward stance and our forward stance, and you're expected to hold this the whole time, but should you use it all the time? Not necessarily. What the hinge tip is really good for is centralizing everything. So, for example, uh, I even do this in longsword, and at some point when I go over Wallerstein, I'll, I'll show that. But if I am fighting and I'm expecting more mobility, then I'm going to be more upright, maybe slight hinge, but nothing too, dram too dramatic, you know, normal sort of stance. But if I want to fight in the bind, I will start coming down here and putting a little more of my energy into it. Because essentially what it is, it's kind of going from upright and moving to grappling, in my mind at least. So that's kind of how the hinged hip works. Now, we went over a lot of concepts, a lot of different things. I didn't go over any moves in specific because I really didn't want to. There's so much to be learned when it comes to sword and buckler, but those are the basic bits of advice that I have for you. If you would like to um, learn how to do certain cuts or other things, I have other videos in the channel where I have gone over it. The, um, I believe I go over how to do the uh, Meyer cutting pattern with a buckler. I also have some other cutting patterns up there with buckler, and there's a ton of resources on things like bolognese, etc. So 
really the biggest thing to practice when it comes to learning sword and buckler is getting your posture right to the point that your arm doesn't feel so heavy anymore. Because this one's going to be on screaming. This one will scream a little bit later. Getting used to moving the buckler around so you're not hitting it as much. Because the worst thing in the world is when you hit your own buckler when you needed to be hitting him. And then keeping your feet and your posture used to moving back and away from opponents because they're going to be cutting for your leg and your ribs pretty much constantly. Don't make those be vulnerable, right? I believe I also have a whole video on defending your leg where I go over some sword and buckler options. So otherwise though, a bit of a rambly video, but hopefully that gives you an idea of the basics of sword and buckler and how to get started. And there are other things I didn't touch on. If you have any questions, feel free to ask me in the comments below. I don't know if anybody comments on these, um, but otherwise, Thank you very much, and we'll go over some other techniques and weapons another time.